Hi, welcome to yet another practical session. We've been talking a lot about theory for the last two lessons, and we've introduced the idea of memory colors, and we hope that you are slowly starting to watch over the shades of vegetation and the sky. You pay special attention, uh, attention to them, both in your own work and the works of other artists. We have also learned how to create and even more importantly, to improve the materials of greenery so that we have total control over them uh, at a small cost. Everything is production ready. The greens are good enough without spending time on every single detail. And today we'll make a deep dive into a practical side of things. We'll come back to the subject of HDRIs. You will learn lots of new tools that will allow you to set your daytime scenario. We'll go in depth into using environment slots. We'll touch the basics of volumetrics and dive into advanced use of Corona Color Correct. You'll find out what it's all about real soon. We will also build two scenarios, one with a lawn and the other one with reflections in the water. So something new. We will use one of our favorite HDRIs from the previous lesson. And then we will do a new scenario with the water in the scene. We promise you great results, although we will have to get a little bit creative. So let's begin. We go back to the same place in our scene where we left off last time. So we've set our HDRI, the one that we used last time, 1714. We have it attached separately to the illumination slot and the direct visibility slot. You can also use 3D Collective 1751 attached to this training. We have our planes inserted with the tree opacity map applied to them. As a reminder, we can run interactives to see what it looks like. I'm just going to turn off the high poly assets and let's see. As we can see, this is where we left off with the last practice lesson. The HDRI is set up and the light direction is adjusted according to the mid-ground. We skipped the background because we were finishing it off in Photoshop. We controlled the foreground with planes with the opacity map. They are still looming around here somewhere. The whole thing is covered by the default tone mapping with ACES, where we added a tone curve to lift these shadows a bit. This time we'll go about the scenario differently. We'll turn off the ACES and turn on the filming mapping. We will add a filming mapping from the list and we'll set the highlight compression to value of 1. By the way, we can see that highlight compression in filming mapping mainly compresses the high ranges. What happens down here does not change. And if the image seems a bit flat, we can always use this Read Shadows option. This way we'll get some contrast down here. The shadows will separate from the mid-range and it will all become more punchy. We don't have to go with it as far down as to 1. Sometimes it can turn out to be too dark, but it's definitely an option to quickly add some contrast in these areas here. Let's make a quick test here and see what's the difference between ACES and filming mapping. We can add this image to the history, turn on ACES, and compare it with the one stored in the history. We yet have to click Show in Original Post Processing, and now we can compare two tone mappings. They are quite similar, especially in the tonal ranges. This is why we raise the shadows in ACES, bringing them closer together. However, we can see that choosing one or the other tone mapping not only changes these values in the image, but also changes how the colors look like. Let's check out the sky. The colors of the sky are completely different here. Here we have more isolated blue, tilting a bit into magenta, I would say it seems more natural. And here we have a blue turning heavy into cyan. 
and it's all based on one HDRI. Just two different types of tone mapping. So let's remember that each HDRI can also be calibrated differently. Some will be calibrated to run in one tone mapping out of the box. Others will work with a different one. So we cannot expect that everything will work perfectly each and every time. Some moves might be necessary on our part to just slightly fine tune it to what we need in our scenario. So we can see that in the context of these memory colors we talked about in the theoretical lesson, every step we take changes what we are uh, dealing with. Even the tone mapping itself can dramatically change the memory colors. Not to mention that the expression of greenery, saturation and similar aspects also change here. We'll come back to this later. For now, let's go back to the interactive. We ended the last lesson with the image looking like this, because we decided to work on the background in Photoshop. Although we'd like to have other options as well. For example, it would be nice if we could do it in 3D. So what are our options here? The simplest approach to the topic is Corona Volumetric Material. And we'll implement it in this scenario. We are looking for this material in the Corona Materials. The Corona Volume Material. This material only has a few parameters. So it looks kind of easy, right? But don't let it trick you. Volume Material is a very powerful tool. It gives great opportunities. In fact, we'll devote the entire four lessons just on how to use it. But that will come at the end of the training. For now, we'd like to think of it a bit like the Corona volume effect we used before. It allowed us to get an aerial perspective in our scene. You can use both for the same purpose, but you need to be aware of some differences between them. Because the Corona volume effect is basically an overlay to the Corona sky. On the other hand, Corona Volume Material is physically correct and takes longer to render, or even way longer depending on how we are going to use it. And it may sound a bit mysterious at this moment, but don't worry, the time will come for a deep understanding of uh, Volume Material. Today we will teach you just one cool trick. We want uh, to finally get this background in place and build the depth in the scene using just 3D. And we'll use two parameters for this. The distance parameter, which will generally define the fog density in our scene. And the color parameter for scattering, which will define the color of our fog. It will tint colors in the volumetric material area. So we can introduce volumetric material to our scene in several ways. We'll talk about them again later, but the simplest option is to use it globally. Here we have global volume material. We set it as active and nothing has happened yet because we have nothing attached here. We can connect our material as an instance and still nothing happens since the distance is set to zero. So it considers this object as non-existent. But if we type anything in here, suddenly fog will cover our whole scene. And at this value it's so dense we can hardly see anything here. Let's try to give it 10 times the value. Now we can see something changing. Suddenly the whole scene is darker. And this is because the scattering color here is pure black. Let's try to drag this mid-gray here and see how the scene behaves now. And bam, there is a fog. With black scattering before, it looked unrealistic, not the natural. That's why we generally avoid extreme scattering colors, but with medium gray we'll just get this milky fog flooding the scene. So suddenly the entire scene became hazy. The light beaming from HDRI is more diffused and weaker. The highlights are not as expressive, we've lost some of the colors and the sky has almost no color at all. The fog is that thick. And generally we don't want to flood this scene with the fog like that. 
We are going for a commercial scenario with an impression of an aerial perspective somewhere in these mountains in the background. We don't want to modify everything with a thick fog. So we have to tweak this distance value a bit. If we increase it by 10 times, the scene will become much more accessible. We can go up with this to 200,000 centimeters, and these numbers obviously depend on the scene. If the scene is smaller or larger, the suitable amount of the distance parameter will be different. You just have to try it in interactive and decide based on what you see. There is no one universal value here that works in every case. And we can already see that something is changing here with this value set. It's a bit higher than it was, so let's compare it. And we can see that these colors and these ranges were much lower here. When added this, they went up. And as for this volumetric material, there is yet another aspect regarding color. When we use the Corona volume effect, I mean that option in Corona Sky, it sort of automatically adjusted the color overlay to this sky color. And it was quite reliable in terms of this color relationship. However, we don't have such information here. In fact, if we lower this value again to make the fog stronger, we can see that this gray color starts to dominate. We can see that the fog here is grayish, maybe even a little warm, due to the fact that the sun is shining and it's quite warm illumination. But we can fix it using the color scattering parameter. So far, we've set it as mid-gray, but we can change this color at will. And we can change it for instant to a bluish one, so it better matches the color that we would expect from the aerial perspective. This way it looks much better than it did with a gray scattering. The fog is too strong, obviously, so let's just go back to some higher numbers here. I think adding an extra zero should do the job. Alright, this scenario is pretty much ready and everything was quick, easy and fun. In fact, let's check if we did everything as it should be done. We can check our values here. And they seem to be okay. It doesn't differ much from what we had before. Maybe we could raise these shadows a touch more. Most of the blacks and whites landed more or less where it needs to be and we don't lose any detail in here. But maybe I will go back to rich shadows at 0.8, even though both values seems to be okay. So this is the first thing we generally check. Does the depth work? And it does. The background seems to be a little more distant now. The fox not overdone, and we definitely read it as situated farther away than the midground, so this element is also checked. And basically that's it for this corona frame buffer. The direction of the light goes hand in hand with our composition and directs our eye to architecture. The memory colors are adjusted accordingly. If we have an interesting composition and the right materials, the setting, uh, then setting the light as simple as this one is basically a no-brainer. Nevertheless, you'll soon see that sometimes it all collapses like a house of cards, especially if you choose a wrong HDRI or you can't reveal its hidden potential. So we can turn uh, the interactive off and quickly move on to the theory. So we've used a really good HDRI to make this scenario and it was easy to optimize it. However, not everything works so well in everyday life. In fact, working with HDRI can uh, have ups and downs. If you happen to hit a wall in the past, we'll tell you what mostly probably went wrong and how to uh, avoid it in the future. Depending on which HDRI we choose, we can achieve different effects. You probably already can guess that different HDRIs illuminate the scene differently. 
Each HDRI is made by different artists with different equipment. There are various ways to calibrate and create an HDRI. So there is no like industry standard for them. There is no scale to grade any HDRIs with let's say five stars. If someone creates an HDRI, uh, he or she simply encounters specific weather conditions. And we are not just talking about clouds and sun here. In addition, there can be various aerosols in the air. We could have some dust, some humidity, and all that diffuses the light in a specific way. This will affect the light and shadows, making it softer or the opposite, more intense. This is just one aspect that can affect illumination. The second one can be, for example, the lens optics. If the lens causes a large flare near the sun's disk, it will also shine a bit in an HDRI. And those are nuances that will make it illuminate better or worse. The calibration process, we also mentioned earlier, will of course uh, affect whether there will be any unwanted discoloration. Simply put, some HDRIs are just better than others. Some are good, others not so much. We see a huge range of colors and the illumination works differently each time. It differs in intensity and softness of the shadow. We have run a test. We took a lot of HDRIs, the popular ones and those less popular too. We set them up without any additional adjustments. You can see that they have very, very different characteristics. We've selected them all as more or less daytime HDRIs, but we can see that some of them are way warmer than expected. We can test immediately uh, in real time, check our perception of memory color. We can see how the greenery looks like, how the sky looks like. Are colors realistic or do they look artificial? Is it attractive to us or does it need to be changed? If we compare many examples like this, it will be relatively easy to come up with an internal benchmark of memory color. This is pretty much it when it comes to theory. Let's move on to practice, see potential issues with color and HDRIs and how to fix them. And if you find yourself in a similar position where everything is tinted and decreasing gamma doesn't really change the illumination, it means it's the time to use something different. Okay, so we come back to our scene as we left it. And now we are going to change the setting, make it a little bit more exciting, because for the first time we are going to create a scenario with water. Previously we changed layers from high poly to low poly to switch from production render to interactive render. And if we turn off both most layers, we will have a hole with water in it. There was water hidden underneath this whole time. And we can implement this scenario where instead of grass, instead of moss, we will simply have a large reflective surface which can radically change our composition in some scenarios. You will see that it looks pretty cool real soon. So before we move on to some more advanced HDRI wizardry, let's do a little test first. Let's see if HDRI will work well for illumination in our scene. There are tons of different HDRIs on the market and some of them we can reject right away. And in the first lesson we've mentioned that HDRIs have a certain range, a certain depth. This is going to be one of the deal breakers for us and in a moment you'll see why. So we run a new HDRI. I'm creating a Corona bitmap. And I have an HDRI from no emotion here. And we'll use it as an example. And to be fair, they were one of the first free HDRIs and on top of that, I want to stress that they are free. So lots of press is due to no emotion for the huge amount of work they've put in making it all available to the community. Besides that, the resolution is substantial. This one has 15,000 pixels on the long side and they work very well as a backplate. Some also work well as a source of lighting, especially in the evening HDRIs when it's cloudy and we don't need a huge tonal range. 
However, when it comes to illumination from daytime HDRIs, we can encounter examples here that will uh, cause us some problems. In fact, we don't see much on these previews. Maybe in this night shot we see some details. And in daytime no emotion HDRI, we can see the color of the sky, clouds, what's going on here, and it doesn't bode well. This indicates that this HDRI may not have the tonal range we would hope for. Ok, let's open it up. You remember earlier with HDRI 1714, nothing was visible and now we can see some plants, fields, paths. Everything is visible. Ok, but let's try and see how it works. Let's connect it to Corona Color Correct. And maybe we'll turn off Volumetric for now. Turn off the override and just connect it to the illumination and see how it looks like. We can see that everything is darker, so I will rise its exposure. And straight away we can see something's wrong. And basically it's the entire lighting. To compare it better, Let's set the same direction of light we had before, just to be sure that the sun isn't blocked by any tree or something. So now the sun is shining from the same side over here. This facade should be fully illuminated. However, it's not. The lighting of the scene is very flat, as if on a cloudy day, to say the least. We can go down with the exposure to, let's say, minus 4, minus 5. And what do we see in the preview? Before, when we set the exposure very low, the sun stayed and continued to shine as a very bright point. Now, however, the whole thing just goes all the way down as if it was in some JPEG. So the levels of those clouds are very close to the level of the sun, which actually explains what's happening here. That's why we have flat illumination. Everything around shines equally. The clouds are shining and the bright sky is shining, plus the sun is shining, but it's not separate enough from the rest to shed any strong light. We said before that we can change the sun's to sky's brightness ratio with the gamma shift. And we can see that it kind of works here. When we lower gamma, the sky goes down and the sun goes up a notch. And it's better now, but even in this preview, we can see that the clouds closest to the sun are still very bright. There is not much of a difference between them and they shine all the same. Maybe the clouds near the horizon actually moved away a bit, but the sun still shines almost exactly like these clouds. And generally this illumination is very diffused. Not to mention the colors of the whole scene. If we try to increase the saturation even more, we can see that basically the whole scene is flooded with this unpleasant blue tint. Except for this greenery that still somehow resists it, but is also very cold and unpleasant. So it's really hard to do anything with this HDRI to get good illumination. Ok, now we will implement another example and we'll try again to achieve relatively good results. We'll take HDRI from a Chaos Cloud and we'll pay close attention to its interaction with uh, neutral materials. For instance, grey ones without any discoloration. This way, we'll be able to spot if this HDRI itself has any discoloration in it uh, that could distort our perception. And as we said before, we'll watch out if the sunlight's warm and the shadows have a slight bluish tint. So we'll look at the sun's to sky's brightness ratio. We'll want to have contrast here to avoid this washed out look. Ultimately, we'll look at the behavior of the materials in the scene, especially the plants, and we check how the sky looks like. We review whether the colors represent what we've set in the materials, whether they have any strange discoloration, cold shades, 
tints, especially towards magenta or green, which always seem uh, artificial, unnatural and out of place. So we can turn off the interactive for now. And let's go into Chaos Clowns browser. And here's a whole bunch of HDRIs we can use. We will take daytime HDRI. And we've already downloaded the 30 web. All we need to do is click this icon here. And we'll immediately have a new Corona bitmap here, overwritten over that was here before. And this is our HDRI from Chaos Cosmos. Just like last time, we'll add Corona Color Correct to have additional control over it. And let's just see how it looks like in interactive. If it's too bright, it's because the exposure is erased from the previous example. I will just change the rotation of this HDRI so it's identical to the last one. And let's go down with the exposure to levels where the illumination makes sense. So we can already see that this is visibly better than the last time. But the image is still rather flat. The sunlight's not that intense, and the overall feeling is not punchy enough. Frankly speaking, most of HD rides from Chaos Cosmos uh, are really great. Possibly the only drawback is their relatively low resolution. 7500 on the longer side. It's two times smaller than, for example, those from No Emotion. However, in our shot, with this wide focal length of the camera, that aspect shouldn't be a problem. On the other hand, this particular HDRI provides a lighting that's not exactly what we are looking for in this scene. We could just pick another one, but we are also able to fix this one. The first thing I wanted to do is just to readjust those planes that cover the foreground. This HDRI shines from above and the planes are too low to cast a shadow on the foreground. So we will scale it a little on this axis, so it does not disturb the perception. And it should be okay now. Okay, now we can address the problem of flat illumination. And as we said before, we can always reduce the exposure a bit. And in return, turn it up here. It's easier to work when you see the HDRI in the preview window instead of, you know, everything being so bright. So it will be more convenient to raise this exposure here and lower it here. We also said that turning gamma down will allow us to enhance our perception of sunlight. Well, uh, let's set it to 0 0.9 and see. And suddenly a lot is changing. Suddenly the scene comes to life. Let's see what we had here before. The light was flat, sad, colorless, uh, not so warm. And with a value of 0 0.9, maybe 0 0.91, suddenly this perception is completely different. We can see the difference between an illuminated facade and a facade in the shadow. Even the greenery comes out. And suddenly it becomes much juicier, more interesting. So it's definitely a good move forward. And at this point I want to add that of course Gamma helped us rise the impression of warm light. But if you feel something still missing, we can for example modify the HDRI temperature. 
By raising the white balance here, we make the highlights appear warmer. We also warm the whole picture. But if we still think the whole thing is too cold, then we can rise it up. Anything rising it up to 7500 is a good move. If we still have a color problem, we can always consider, for example, a tint that will give some shade to the whole HD array. However, it seems to me that in this case it's not necessary. Although we can tell that these clouds seem a little too bright. I mean, we are losing a little detail on them. And override might prove helpful here. We can use the override in the direct visibility. So uh, we only need to copy, mm, maybe not, don't copy the corona color, just copy the both nodes. I'll tell you why in a moment. And we will put the second map as the instance in this slot. This way we'll be able to modify its brightness regardless of the brightness of the entire illumination. I think we can lower it a bit. What's more, if we do not want to lower it completely, we can also modify it independently with the curve. Although I think that at minus 6 these blues look quite okay. What else? We can, for example, subtract a little from white without touching the darker areas. The clouds go a little lower and the sky stays where it was, more or less. I think that after these changes, the sky is also very cyan, so we could change the hue. Maybe not that much. Let's turn a bit towards a blue magenta, so it looks a bit more natural. We can also turn the sky a bit. This way it will fit better in terms of composition. So the cloud line will match the rest and at the same time the illumination of the whole scene won't change. We can do it independently because we also made a copy of HDRI source node earlier. And as for the over reflection refraction slot, maybe the reflection of the clouds is not entirely consistent since we've moved these clouds. So maybe I will swap these slots. So we'll just turn it to 0 0.19 to have this reflection as similar as possible. When it comes to how we illuminate the scene, it stays the same as we do not change the brightness of this HDRI in the reflections. It could result in something weird otherwise. For example, the scene would go too bright or too dark, so I don't want to change that. We can leave it like this. Now, all that's left to do is to bring the volumetric back and see how it's coming out. Okay, so the scene is a bit smoky. We could try to tweak this value like that. to place the volumetric visible only in the background, so it slightly flattens contrast there.
if we decide to make it stronger, it wouldn't necessarily harmonize with this scene, with this atmosphere we are trying to build. And of course, there are other ways to solve it. We'll learn them in the next lessons. For now, we'll leave it with this simple solution. At this stage, we can render this scene and think about some changes in post-production stage. We'll check if we can possibly make it a little more attractive. So I will turn off interactive. I will switch to high poly assets. And we can go straight to a full production render. Okay, so the render is ready and we can go into post-production. In the first step, I would like to slightly tweak the ranges on the curve to boost the luminosity a bit. I will add one more curve to vignette control. A bit of vignette here. And we can go to the color control. In the last lesson, we learned how to use selective color. And now I want to show you some other tools. The first will be color balance. Color balance is a different way of thinking about color. Now we don't think of colors as certain ranges on the color wheel, but something we pour into our shadows, midtones, or highlights. And generally, in a scenario like this, we want the highlights to be warm and the shadows to be cold to some extent. Of course, on the one hand, the HDRI imposes it to a degree, and we have already seen that. On the other hand, we made some HDRI corrections in the material which improved the situation a bit. Here, we can additionally, for example, add some warm tones, turn it a little to yellow, to red. We can already see that these highlights on the facade become warmer. Likewise, we can add a little blue to the shadows and they will become a little colder. We can add some cyan as well, but literally a pinch. I turned it the wrong way, of course. Now these shadows are colder, but careful not to overdo it. And we can also pour some color in the mid-tones. At the moment it seems that we need nothing more, but sometimes it's a good idea to try some left and right turns here, because sometimes we can miss an opportunity. This is not necessarily the case here, but sometimes pouring a bit of color into mid-tones can dramatically improve the tone of the image. So that would be it when it comes to color balance. We haven't made any dramatic changes here, but I think we have improved this temperature ratio a bit. One more thing I wanted to show is hue saturation. We get three sliders here, so we can change hue, we can change saturation, and we can change brightness. It is obvious, right? What's not obvious is that it allows us to operate on individual ranges in addition to the entire range. It's the same we had with selective color here. We can mark the greens, for example, and we can see where they fall on the scale in this chart down here. We gain a rigid framework with an entire scope of our intervention. And we have falloffs here, 
from full intervention to zero intervention. Interestingly enough, we can also use this hand and sample a specific color. So we can modify now a specific range. We can raise the saturation to the maximum to see clearly what we are doing and what our intervention is about. If we decide, for example, we would like it to be less green, we can always move these sliders a little and narrow down the range. So we've selected the sky and the water. And what would I like to do here? I think this saturation is a bit too strong, so I would lower it down. I would also darken the whole thing and maybe move it a bit towards magenta. So we are taking the sky down a little bit. I don't want the saturation to be so strong. I want to darken the little desaturate it and turn it down. I think the image in this form is more naturalistic. Okay, so we took care of one memory color and it's time for the other one, the greens. Now, this one is going to be a bit more difficult because greens are very diversified. We have the aerial perspective from volume material, so clearly colors are a bit washed out. We have different shades here, but the main thing is that we have various levels of saturation. Some colors like this and those here are saturated and some are washed out. And we'll use just the hue saturation tool to sample some of these colors. We should go to yellows instead of changing colors with master change. Let's dial it down because I don't want these stones, I just want that bamboo. I'm done. And of course we can also use a mask, for example to restrain it a bit more with gradients, if we only want to control the bamboo. And I would just take some of this saturation off. Wait a second. Something went crazy here. Okay, I'd like to take some of this saturation off of this. Maybe it turned green just a smidge. This area right here was very intense and now we've given it quite naturalistic tones, similar to those trees, for example. Furthermore, we have the meadow with yellow blades of grass and I don't think it looks good in this scenario. So let's use a hue saturation layer again. Target just the yellow snippets and try to narrow them down. Don't worry about it, we'll add an extra mask on it later. And we'll turn it towards green to make it darker, more desaturated. We'll fix the rest with a mask and we can recover these stones with a soft brush. And that already helps a bit in the readability of these colors in this area. Let's do one more move like this with the trees. So just like the last time, if we see that we've hit the trees well, we can add a mask to exclude other areas from this impact. As for these trees, I'd like to darken them a little. 
At the same time, I'm adding saturation to correct it because darker trees will automatically seem more desaturated. So I have to add some saturation to compensate for the change in brightness. It seems to be much better now. Maybe we could try to do something about that moss. All right, we managed to hit it directly. Let's maybe desaturate it. But this color is a bit strange in the context of the scene. We can try to shift it a little more towards the orange, so it resembles these stones more. There will be no weird green and yellow buildup that has nothing to do with anything else. So, as you can see, we simply operated on colors, mainly in the blue and green ranges. That's something we should be particularly sensitive to. That's everything we've learned in the previous theoretical lesson. And we tried to narrow it down, whether in terms of hue, saturation or brightness. So the image is not all over the place. This can happen if we have a lighting that's less than optimal. We did our best to keep it all together. We can add some vignette at the bottom the normal one. And let's reduce the opacity so that this area does not stand out so strong. We can fix this corner a bit more and now we can consider this image done. All right, we've managed to build this scenario and we've done a lot here. At first, we've used one HDRI and everything was really a smooth sailing. Then we used a slightly troublesome HDRI as well, so you could see a series of small operations that would give you 100% of control. Whether with environment slots or little tweaks with Corona Color Correct. You can always go back to memory colors and keep them in mind at all times. Greenery and sky will be your compass, telling you whether you are on the right track. Besides that, look at the brightness levels and remember all we've talked about before. And this is the end of this big daytime lighting segment. In the next lesson, we'll see the sun a little lower on the horizon, as it will be sunset. So, see you soon.